Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to present uh, Richard Alexander, an expert in star formation, planet formation, black hole formation, predominantly from a theoretical perspective. Well, why are you pushing it? Oh, <laughs> That's what it said online. Yeah. <laughs> so, Richard got his PhD from Cambridge, then had some postdocs and fellowships at New Colorado and then Leiden and then Leicester, where he is currently the professor of theoretical astrophysics. Today, Richard will be telling us about the evolution of dynamics of planet planets. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's been great to be here, catch up with some people I haven't seen in a, in, in a few years. I haven't been here. I think the last talk I gave here was about 10 years ago, so the building has changed and things are things are different. But uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about um, mainly planet forming disks, and I'm going to talk about three different pieces of work that our group in Leicester have done um, on how disks evolve and what they're made of and what drives the evolution, and also at the end a bit about planets. And this is a nice press release image from NASA that is not as an actual image, of course, it's an artist's impression, but you'll come back to the at the end, I'll come back to why that's actually not a terrible artist's impression for the system we're talking about. Um, but I want to highlight that a lot of the work I'm going to talk about has been done by, by students and postdocs, in particular, Simin Tong, who's a second year PhD student in Leicester, working with me. And one of the papers we're talking about is, is her recent work. Julia Balabio was a student in Leicester who's now a postdoc at Imperial. And again, I'm talking about some of her work. And the last part is largely work that was led by Bank Nealon, who was a postdoc in Leicester and is now faculty in Warwick. And then lots of other people the observations are certainly not mine. Galaria and co have led much of the observations, so they deserve a lot of the credit for what I'm going to talk about today. The blame for the mistakes is on me. But um, yeah, so to motivate this, I'm going to have a sort of whistle-stop intro to motivate what I'm talking about. The thing that I'm sure you've all seen before is that, is that exoplanets are everywhere. This is one version of the plot showing orbital separation against mass of all the known exoplanet systems, or what was all the known exoplanet systems when I made this plot, so it's probably out of date by now. And the color coding is my detection method, but the take home message is basically that almost all st stars we look at have planets. Most of the planets that we see look nothing like anything in the solar system. And there's an enormous diversity in what we see. We have, these are sort of, you know, super Earths in, in orbits of a few days. These are or well, Jupiters. These are things that look not unlike Jupiter, but a bit bigger. These are things way, way further out than anything in the solar system. Basically, this, the lack of things down here is detection biases we can't we're not sensitive enough to detect those but essentially everywhere we look and can see planets we do see planets and there's a huge diversity and trying to understand how how we get there is is sort of the motivation for what i'm going to talk about but that's i'm now not going to talk about planets for the next half hour at least i'm going to talk about disks because if we want to understand planet formation we have to think about disks all young stars like the sun form with with disks they're a natural byproduct of star formation and momentum is conserved things collapse they spin up and you're left with a disk and most of the mass that's funneled onto the star comes through the disk at some point. And on time scales, observationally, at about a few million years, stars evolve from young stars like the sun look like this, or actually like this, at uh, about a million years old. And by the time you get to 10 million years old, they look like this, where you've got a, this is a gas rich disk, with enough gas in it to make maybe 10 to 100 Jupiters if you used all the mass. By the time you get to this phase, you're down to basically rocks only, not very much mass, certainly not enough mass to still make planets. So this is the planet forming epoch. By the time you get to here, there's not enough mass left in your disk to make planets. So this is where you have to have to form the planets. And of course, the, the idea that planets forming disks goes back to, I guess, Kant or Laplace or something. It goes way, way back. But up until fairly recently, five years ago or so, we used to show this with cartoons. This is the sort of things that were drawn in the 80s. We have unresolved images. We've inferred these things, but we don't do that anymore. We can. This is how far we've moved forward. This is what disks look like with ALMA. We can resolve them. This is about 65 AU across. Um, seen in the millimeter with ALMA. And this is a young exoplanet system, which is slightly chopped off. It's HRD799, observed with, with Gemini and Keck with adaptive optics. And the scale here is a, the innermost one here is about the orbit of Neptune, it's about 20 AU. And we're actually watching direct imaging planets go around in real time. So we no longer have cartoons. We have real observations of resolved disks with structures and gaps and rings. They're not as smooth as we thought they were. And we have young exoplanet systems that we can see orbiting and we can measure their properties. We can't actually, most of the, most of the Planets on here are giga years old, but we do now have a handful of detections of, of young ones as well. And so the motivation for my talk is essentially why should you care about disks around young stars and why not? Why am I not going to talk about planets? Well, if we want to understand planet formation, the disk provides the raw materials and the conditions for planet formation. All the inputs to planet formation physics are set by the disk. Density, temperature, dust to gas ratio, chemical composition is all set by what's going on in the disk. And so 
if you don't understand your disk, any predictive model of plan information is basically impossible. You've got no idea what your initial conditions are. The second thing is that the disk lifetime, which is set by disk physics and the evolution of the disk, is a hard upper limit for all of your planet formation processes. So all your planet formation has to happen, certainly all the gas giant planet formation has to happen before the gas disk is gone. Um, and also, once you form planets, when you've got a Jupiter or super Jupiter sitting in a disk, most of the mass of the system and almost all the angular momentum of the system is still in the disk. And so once the planets form, how they accrete and how they migrate, how their orbits change, is again determined by disk physics, not necessarily by the physics of planet formation. So those are the kind of theoretical reasons why disks are important and control what happens to planets. And the last reason is that at the youngest ages, we can't actually detect exoplanets directly because all the methods we use for transits and radial velocities, all those things, rely on the star being very quiet and stable. And young stars are neither quiet nor stable. And so you can't detect radial velocities and transit detections around young stars because the stars are too active and too variable. So the only way to see planets at this age million year old is to see their signatures in the disk. They create gaps and structures and other things. And so we can use the disk also to detect planets and see things that are happening. So yeah, we should care about planets because the, the disks, because they're the inputs to our planet formation models, but also they're the only way we can see planets while they're forming. And I'm going to talk mostly about this part, but then a little bit about this part at the end of the talk. So that's my kind of introduction. And the, the next sort of motivation thing is the protoboundary disks are not static. We know from observations that they live for a few million years. If you look at one million year old clusters, all the stars have disks. If you look at 10 million year old clusters, a handful of stars have disks, a few percent at most. The typical disk lifetime is a few million years. And we observe accretion. We observe disk material falling onto the star. You can observe the accretion luminosity. You can measure it directly. And we know that the rate of accretion is high enough to drive significant evolution on, on mega year time scales. But typically, the, the time, if you do m disk over m dot to get a time scale, you get a few million years for most sources. Um, the question is then why the disks accrete? And this comes back to basically classical accretion disk theory. Is that basically, if you want to accrete in a, in a disk around a star, you have, to, the, the, you have to lose angular momentum. And so disks can evolve either due to losing mass or by accreting onto the star. And to accrete inwards, you have to lose angular momentum to go, a Keplerian orbit has to lose angular momentum to go inwards. And historically, we always thought that worked the same way as accretion disks around black holes work. The disk is turbulent, the turbulence exchanges angular momentum, the, some material passes the angular momentum outwards, the outer disk expands, the inner disk accretes. And that was always our picture of how protoplanetary disks accrete. And the mass loss was thought to be due to thermal processes, stellar radiation, heating the disk surface and driving a wind. That's known as photo evaporation. That removes mass, but it doesn't drive any accretion. It just depletes the disk. So that was one picture, and the, my, my thesis was working on that kind of thing, looking at how disks evolve. But we always kind of knew along the way that protoplanetary disks are cold. They're basically neutral. They don't couple well with magnetic fields. And so relying on magnetic fields to drive turbulence is somewhat questionable. And after 10 years of subsequent work, we now understand pretty well that actually large regions of disks are what we call dead to magnetic instabilities and turbulence. They're dead zones. And in those winds, instead, the magnetic fields tend to drive winds and outflows. They tend not to give you turbulence. They tend to reorder in the neutral region, field lines go straight and you, you extract angular momentum and a magnetized wind gives you a torque because the, the field line acts as a lever arm. So when a, ma a mag magnetized wind pulls away material from the disk, it depletes the disk, but it also gives you a torque and it drives accretion in the disk that's left behind. So you can either have disk accretion driven by turbulence, local magneto rotational instability is known, or by large scale torque from the winds. And the mass loss can either be through magnetic, magnetic winds or, or thermal photo evaporative winds. And to understanding which of those it is, or basically, in reality, we think probably both of those happen in different regions. Um, that's key if we want to understand what's driving disk evolution and what the disk looks like and why disks are evolving on mega year time scales. And so the talk is going to have sort of three parts to it. The first two parts are going to be about disk evolution, looking first at winds and then at accretion. And then the last part, I'm going to talk a bit about planets and disks and tilts and warps and looking for signatures. So first science part is going to be looking at um, disk evolution models and trying to work out how do real disks actually lose mass. We have two pretty mature models for how this can work, but what's going on in the act, how, do, how well do these things compare to observations? And so the way we do this to go observing disk winds is that we look for emission from the winds, because if we have any kind of disk, this is a schematic I borrowed from my colleague, Ilaria Piscucci, the, step, this, the radiation from the star heats the disk surface layer, and so you have the, the upper layers of the disk are always warmer than what's below. You have an ionized layer on the top, and then you have some warm neutral layers, and then a warm molecular layer and what's underneath. And those hot layers give you emission lines, um, particularly forbidden emission lines that are sensitive to low densities. And so if you're then looking you know, down on the disk from this way, the disk rotating like this, 
and the wind is flowing this way, if you're looking down at the disk from that side, you can see velocity signatures in the winds that are potentially detectable if you look in line emission. And so for a long time, this was done with unresolved line emission. You look for a broad line, you look for low velocity shifts, and this goes back to the 90s and 2000s. But the basic thing is that if the wind is face on, you can't see the backside because the disk is obviously thick. So you just see front side, the wind's going this way, and so you see blue shifted emission lines. So that's the, the key wind diagnostic is blue shifted emission from things that are roughly face on. And so some years ago, I realized that actually the, what some of the best lines for doing this are the fine structure lines that you see in the infrared. That says neon 12.8 microns, neon two. And so we ran some models where this is a photoevaporative disk wind model. The disk is the white bit. The wind is the, the red bit. These are streamlines and velocity structures. And so the disk is rotating like this and the wind is flowing that way and that way. And so if you look at that edge on, what you see is mostly rotation. And so you get a double peak profile, you see Keplerian rotation, and the, the line profile looks like this. When you integrate over the whole system, it's not resolved. Um, but actually, that's what it looks like in a model. If you observe it with the best, this is a mid infrared line. So if you observe it with the best mid infrared spectrograph, highest resolution, best signal to noise, it probably looked more like this, like a very broad line. You wouldn't see a double peak because there just isn't enough resolution. Um, but if you tilt it towards you, so that you only see the front side of the disk, this side is now blocked by the disk. You only see this side. The rotations are now in the plane of the sky, so it doesn't give you a shift. And the shift comes from the, the flow this way. And so you get a blue shifted line by, in this case, five to 10 kilometers per second, that's potentially detectable with something like the zero and the VLT or, or Texies on Gemini, those kind of mid red spectrographs. And so when I made that prediction, the two spectra that existed were terrible and it looked like this wasn't gonna be testable for about a decade. And then I gave a talk on this, I think in Cool Stars, and then Larry Fascucci came bounding down to the audience with the spectrum and went, this looks really like what I've seen. And I thought, crikey, this is a little bit, I was hoping to get my next job before somebody proved it wrong. But um, it turns out that this actually is what we see in quite a lot of sources. And we did the number, Larry led a number of observational programs to look at this. And this is, this is not a typical spectrum. This is the best one we have, obviously. Um, this is TW Hydra and it's the Neon 2 line. And what you see here, this is a very long VLT spectrum in one line. The velocity scale here is 10 kilometers per second. And the, the models are the red and the blue, and the black is the data, and it's about as good an agreement as you could get for a model that wasn't actually fit. Those are just predictions that were then verified by the data. What you see here, neon is, a, this is an ionized emission line with a relatively low critical density. So the fact that you see it blue shifted and TW Hydra is pretty much a face on disk is an unambiguous detection of a slow, low velocity, five to 10 kilometer per second ionized wind. So that part, even without models, we're seeing winds. The evaporation is happening. That part's good. The caveat here is that the two models here, one of which is mine and one of which is from Robert Oclano and James Owen, have are different wind models with different ionization fractions. Because you're only seeing the ions, you're not sensitive to the bulk flow of the hydrogen. And you can't tell if it's entirely ionized or partially ionized. And so it turns out 1% ionization and 100% ionization give you more or less the same line profile in the, in the neon, but a factor of 100 difference in the wind outflow rate. So Detecting the wind is not enough. If we want to know more about it, we need to understand the spatial configuration or be able to get more tracers to nail down the density because the neon lines are degenerate in the density below a threshold. You don't get a good constraint. But they the degenerate in the ionization fraction. So we, we're seeing mass loss, we're seeing evaporation, but we don't know how much mass loss is going on. And so to follow this up, this was Julia Bellavio's PhD or part of her PhD. Um, the problem with doing this is that these simulations are still pretty expensive. You, can't, you can do this for a small number of specific models, you can't do it for a huge sample of models with loads of different parameters because the hydro models coupled to radio transfer take forever. And so we wanted a quicker way to do the hydro. And so uh, Kathy Clark and I, I say Kathy Clark and I, Kathy came up with an analytic solution to approximate the wind solutions, which I then benchmarked against numerical models. And we wrote a paper publishing the solutions. And basically that allows us to do the a good approximation to the hydro quickly, and then do radio transfer calculations to predict line profiles for a whole different range of lines and a whole different range of models, span the parameter space without burning more computing time than there is. And so um, this was Julia benchmarking different models against the, the, the full, the different um, analytic models against the full models for the different line predictions. And they work best for the low inclination that they're a bit iffy at high inclination. Um, but actually, if you're looking at how many approximations there are in the solution, it's a miracle that they work this well at all. Um, but the solution works far better than it should, given the approximations that are in it. And so we were able to then use this to make predictions for lots of different parameters, lots of different models, look at different densities, sound speeds, ionization thresholds and things. And so what we find actually looking at the data is that the, wind, the, the, the lines when you're looking at different tracers don't give you a coherent story. 
If you look at the neon lines, which trace low density ionized gas, this is from Julia's work. This is basically looking at the, the two observables you can look at with unresolved data are the blue shift and the line width. Um, you can maybe do shape if you have really high resolution data, but mostly you get a width and you get a blue shift. So the blue shifts in kilometers per second are this way, and the uh, the widths are here. And this is a function of inclination. So as you tilt the disk, you see a, bro a broader line, but less blue shift. And this is basically mo the same model, but with different sound speeds. So this is a hotter wind moving in this direction for thermal wind. And what you see is that basically low sound speeds don't match the blue shifts and don't match the line widths. But when you get up to the higher sound speeds, about 10 kilometers per second, you get a pretty good agreement within the error bars with all the, the neon sources that have been observed at the time and very good agreement with the widths. These two are edge on and they're almost certainly jets that have been misclassified. They're basically almost entirely edge on high velocity jets with a very small component in the place that's put in the sky. So those ones, we're not that bothered about not matching those. This looks pretty good. It's pretty consistent with all the, the population. That's pretty encouraging. If you do the same thing for the neutral oxygen lines that are also blue shifted, you get a very different answer. The neutral oxygen lines are probably neutral gas, lower temperature, you still get an outflow. There, the blue shifts are all small and look like a low velocity wind, but the, the line widths are all large and look like a high velocity wind. So they don't fit well to a thermal model. There, we think we're probably looking at a magnetized outflow rather than a thermal outflow because you you need some, this is the, the, the emission is coming from too close in. The, velocity, the rotational speeds giving you the width of the line are too high for, for thermal pressure to match. You need a magnetic torque to lift it from deeper in the potential to give you the line width and the blue shift that match up. Um, so that the oxygen one, when they are less hot, the caveat is that these are not actually the same sources here and here. There are a handful that are observed in both, but most sources show one set of lines or the other. You don't necessarily, you don't often see both in same, the same sources. So following up, we had a large DLT program to do so some of this data that came from the large program that was led by Ilaria. And essentially we evolved towards this kind of evolutionary scenario as a cartoon where we think the younger disks, which are optically thicker in the inner regions, are have this inner magnetized wind that's extracting angular momentum and driving accretion, and that's pretty optically thick and shields what's going on out here, so you don't get much low density flood evaporation further out. But then the more evolved disks that are, that are depleted in the inner regions um, don't have this such a strong magnetic field. They don't drive magnetic wind for whatever has happened to the magnetic wind. We don't quite know. And you do then see the outer wind and the neon. And so we have this sort of evolutionary scenario where things, these are the ones that you see as, as oxygen one winds, and these are the ones you see as neon winds. And we've shifted from a sort of magnetized mass loss to a, a thermal mass loss as the disks have evolved. With the caveat that we're not looking at this one disk evolving, we're looking at one set of disks that we think are younger and one set of disks that we think are older. But trying to break this degeneracy was the motivation for what we're doing now. And of course, the neon lines, been infrared, they were originally all observed with Spitzer and then done where you could from the ground and we've waited a number of years but now we have JWST and so um I get to talk about this now this is a paper that so this is two papers that were on JWST data they were submitted just before Christmas the observational one came back and was accepted last week and we got our email yesterday saying that the, the theoretical one that was submitted at the same time is going to be several weeks more waiting for a referee's report so they were meant to go together but I think what's going to happen is the observational paper is going to appear on archive later this week um, because the data are public now, we can't sit on it forever. So we, we looked at one particular source. We, we actually had three sources in this survey, cycle one proposal, but two of them were delayed by Miri being offline for six months. And so we're still waiting for the data on the last two, but we got one and it was TCAR, which is a well-known disc in the in the Eda Chameleontis star formation, uh, sort of young cluster. And it was known with Spitzer and it was one of the sources of the blue shift, although as you can see, not the greatest spectrum you'll ever see. Uh, observed by Ilaria and Mike in 2009. So this is at low resolution. This is at 10 kilometer per second resolution. It was observed Spitzer. It's quite a bright line. It's clearly blue shifted in the field, field observations. So it's clearly seeing a photo of the wind, but could we get more with it? It could be get, with JWST, you get the eye view and you can get spatial information. So you're now going to see a beautiful spectrum and some of the worst, ugliest JWST data you're ever going to see. So this is our JWST spectrum. So this is, this is the line with Spitzer. This is the same line with JWST in the whole memory spectrum. The spectrum is spectacular. The signal to noise is incredible. And you get all these lines. We get the argon lines as well, which we didn't have before, and the neon three. And the fact that you get several different ionization states of different lines gives you direct measurements of density, direct measurements of, of temperature sensitivity of the lines. So we get really good constraints on the on the thermal structure and density structure of the wind. And Mary, we don't get velocity information. Mary doesn't have the spectral resolution for velocity information. But it does give you spatial information because maybe you, you get a data cube at every wavelength. And this is not the prettiest 
set of line observations you'll see. But the fact that we can even try and do this is sort of ridiculous, getting resolved line, ob line emission observations. So this is the disk in the continuum, just off the neon line. And this is the disk in the neon line. And the neon line, it's maybe not apparent from this plot, but if you look at the, the profile, the, the neon is spatially extended relative to the continuum by about a pixel, um, which is about, so the, the spatial scale here, this is one arc second, so this is about 60 AU. Um, so we're, it's, we're result, it, it's extended by about 10 to 15 AU over the continuum, and also it's, it's crucially, it's, it's got a different shape. If you do a 2D fit to it, it's extended in a different direction to the continuum. So we're, we're spatially resolving the neon. The argon is not spatially resolved, the shorter wavelength, and that tells us something about the structure. There are different density, different ionization potentials, different density thresholds for the wind. And so being able to, so the, 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 model, the, the observational paper was led by Namanda Judge, who's a student in Arizona, Andrew Selleck, who's a postdoc in Leiden, led the modeling paper, which is still waiting for a referee's report. But basically, we get a clear detection of the wind and the spatial extent of the wind resolved in the line, which is a spectacular observation, even though it looks kind of ugly. Um, the fact that we can even try and do this is kind of bonkers. Um, and then we also get quite good measurements of the properties of the wind from the, the multi-line observations to constrain the temperature. And there's a lot of radio transfer modeling goes into figuring out what we're looking at. What we think we're looking at is essentially something like this, where the inner part, the argon's coming from the inner part of the wind, where it's not spatially resolved, it's heated by the UV. The neon with a different ionization potential is X-ray excited and is slightly further out. And so you get this sort of, the wind has different regions where different ions, ions are tracing different potentials in the different parts of the wind. Question is, is it, is it two flows or is it one big flow with different regions? That part is, is harder to say. But the fact that we can do this and the, the, the wind rate that comes out is relatively high. Um, that's not unexpected because we picked the brightest source to go looking for this. So it's going to be one of the highest wind rates. If it had a lower wind rate, we wouldn't see it. Um, and so, and we also get constraint that the inner edge of the wind has to be something around about an AU. So it probably isn't a magnified flow in this case. It, it's consistent with what we expect for a thermal wind. Um, but this is one source. There are follow-up sources being done by us and others on multiple new ones. Um, so uh, several of the most interesting targets were GTO protected. So I imagine the GTO teams are going to publish them quite soon. We have three more in our cycle one program and we're applying for more in the next round. So yeah, hopefully this will not just be one. This this will appear on AstroPH, I think, on Friday or Monday. And hopefully it won't just be one source. It'll be many sources in, in, a, in about a year. So it's time to try and tell us what's going on in these winds. So that's the winds part. How are discs losing mass? The next question, why do discs accrete? Um, and this is um, this sort of picture of, well, we either have magnetically driven accretion or we have turbulent driven turbulent accretion. And in reality, we probably have both. We have turbulence where the disk is hotter and we have magnetically driven accretion where the disk is colder. Um, but a lot of work recently has gone into trying to figure out what's the dominant driver. Are most disks being driven by magnetic accretion or most disks being driven by turbulent accretion? Um, and this is kind of summarized in a, this is Carlo Minara and Giovanni Rizzotti and co led a chapter in Protostock and Planets last year, where this is the summary of their results. Basically, this is the, the canonical model. The top half of the model is illustrating a magnetically driven model. The bottom half is illustrating a, a viscously driven model. It's kind of the two limiting cases of the, of the accretion scenario. And the way you try and tell the difference between these with statistics or with demographics is you look at the population of disks, where you have masses, you can observe masses, you can observe accretion rates, you can observe sizes. And you basically say, well, how do, how do these different models evolve? And for example, if you look at the disk radius, so this is disk mass and disk radius, as the disk mass de de depletes, as it accretes onto the star, in a viscous model, the disk has to expand to conserve angular momentum. But in a magnetic model, you're carrying away angular momentum, so the disk doesn't expand. And so the viscous model is expected to spread, while the magnetic model either stays the same size or shrinks. And this is kind of how disk evolution has tried to be tied to statistics for a long time. You look at, you know, you have a a model, you make predictions about how mass varies with size or how size varies with age or these kind of things. And you try and compare to what we what we can see. Um, and you look at these kind of two observable planes and look at isochrones and things. And the models make quite distinct predictions for what goes on in these things. But a lot of the um the way and the way this is then done for comparison is that you do kind of people do population modeling, they run a bunch of models, they randomly sample the initial conditions, generate model tracks, and then compare those to the observables. But a lot of the, it's a very degenerate parameter space. There's a lot of models fit the data without, it's one of the, the thing with these models is population models is that you don't learn anything if they fit. If you have a many, many parameters and your model fits, what, what you learn things is when they don't fit, that you rule out parameter space and you figure out what's actually going on. And the problem is that actually it's quite hard to rule out parameter space. Most of the models fit for a pretty broad range of parameters because there are lots of parameters. And so this is an example of a, 
uh, a viscous model, a, a turbulent driven accretion model by the group of Milan, Alicia Semegaziana and co. And this is a, a magnetically wind driven model. Uh, this is this mass accretion rate against this mass for a, an MHD wind model driven by the group in, in Bern. And they both fit the data pretty well at the kind of eyeball level test. And the more physics you add, the harder it becomes to tell them apart. And so what we wanted to say was basically, is there any way to put this on a sort of more empirical footing? Can we do some statistics with this rather than just eyeballing fits and trying to say these things look roughly how they should be? And so the reference just off the bottom. This is my paper from last year. Um, we decided to have go, go and look at uh, this statistically. And to begin with, we decided just to look at one observable, and that's the accretion rate. And the reason for that is it's the observable that has the lowest systematic uncertainties on it. If you look at disk masses, what you're actually doing is measuring a dust mass in a millimeter and then doing a conversion to gas mass by multiplying by 100-ish. And so there are big systematic uncertainties. Likewise, measuring ages at these young ages for individual stars is very hard. You get big systematics. Accretion rates are pretty well measured, particularly now we have guide distances to everything. And so the systematic uncertainties are small, so accretion rates are a good statistical sample. And they exist for most of the nearby star forming regions. So you can look at it. And what we said was basically, if you just look at the distribution of accretion rates, as the model evolves, how long does it spend at a given m dot accretion rate? And you can invert that and say, well, that then gives you a probability distribution. If it spends a lot of time at high m dot, you'll get a lot of high m dot sources and no low m dot sources. And so it turns out the models give you quite different predictions. And the reason for that is that wind driven accretion, the wind, the, the accretion is basically just determined by the magnetic field. And as the disk evolves, the field doesn't change. So the wind, the accretion rate stays more or less constant until the disk is mostly gone. So it spends a lot of time at a high accretion rate and then disappears quite quickly. In a turbulent model, the accretion rate is proportional to the disk mass because it's driven by internal turbulence. So as you accrete the disk, the accretion rate declines, you get a parallel type behavior, and then it gets shut off when the wind stops the accretion. So there you spend most of your lifetime at low, lower accretion rates. And so you get quite different distributions of accretion rates for one model. But this is one model. There's obviously a range of parameters. So the question was, can we actually tell these things apart? First of all, can we tell them apart theoretically? And then can we tell them apart with the data we have? So the first thing was, can we tell them apart in fake, in fake data? So we took our models with one set of parameters and randomly sampled them, added some real observational scatter, added a detection threshold where you can't see the accretion anymore. This is accretion rate against time. The line of the model, these are the synthetic observations that we generate. And then you get a distribution and you do the same thing for your two models, the wind driven and the viscous. And you do it for different numbers of objects. And then you say, well, can we tell them apart with, with observational scatter and the distribution of accretion rates? And the answer is, yes, you can. Um, this is for 250 objects. We have two different histograms. And you know we have good statistical tools. Are these two things drawn from the same distribution? That's a KS test tells you that clearly. And the answer for this is, yes. They're, the probability of these two things being from the same underlying distribution is 10 to minus 8. They're very clearly different. With 250 objects, you can clearly tell these two models apart if there's just two models with fixed parameters and no scatter, which is cheating. Um, the more realistic test is to say, well, let's say the disks have a broad spread of initial conditions, a broad spread of wind rates, a broad spread of turbulent efficiency, a broad spread of properties. Do the pessimistic thing. Let's put order of magnitude scatter on every parameter. Can we still tell them apart? And the answer is always yes. It's just how many objects do you need to tell them apart? Do you need 100 or do you need 10 million? The latter is not viable. And so I ran many, many hundreds of thousands of KS tests. And um, this is basically what we find. The, the black is the, is the cheating case. The red is the real case. We add order dimension scatter to all the different models and then say, can we tell a wind-driven model and a viscous model apart? How many objects do you need? If you only have 10 or 20 sources, the, so this corresponds, if you're doing test tests, this is the probability of them being from the same distribution. So lower probability is telling them apart. And this corresponds to 0.5%, uh, so three sigma, basically. And there's a, we do many realizations. So this is the spread. And what you see is that basically with, with no scatter, by the time you get to 100 sources, you can pretty much always tell them apart. Um, but when you have pessimistic scatter, you need two, 300 objects before you're able to tell these things apart with confidence. But that's not crazy. Three or 400 sources of accretion rates, that's measurable. Um, so that's, you know, that's pretty encouraging. With a few hundred objects, we should be able to tell viscous accretion apart from wind-driven accretion and understand why this is accreting. So then we said, well, let's look at the data. Can we actually do this? And the Carlo and Co's review paper did a systematic study of all the accretion rates that were measured, compiled them on the big table. There are about 400 for all the disks, but they span quite a broad range of stellar masses. And the accretion rate scales very steeply with stellar mass. So you have to cut it in mass. And when you cut it in mass, you end up with only about 100 objects in any given bin. So there aren't quite enough objects to tell the models apart. The answer is basically with 100 objects, you can't distinguish. They both fit reasonably well. 
and most of the parameters aren't strongly constrained. So this is two two things. This is scatter in the initial accretion rate, and the probability is a function of of that. It's basically flat. It's certainly not approaching a significance level. We're not placing a strong constraint there. So basically, I'm, I'm marginalizing over individual parameters here. These are a poor man's corner plot, if you like. Um, this one's interesting, actually. This is the wind rate, the foot evaporation rate, as a function, and, and the probability. To have, and so basically, what we find here is a very up, very high mass loss rates are ruled out in the median, and that's actually consistent with what we expected. And the, the interesting thing is, looking back to the one source we looked at for we measured the accretion rate, it was almost up to ten to the minus eight, which is here getting into the ruled out range. But it's, we think, the upper limit of the distribution. So that's actually more or less consistent. The highest, it's one of the brightest neon sources. It should be a high wind rate. But we think, you know, we're ruling out very, very high wind rates. We prefer lower wind rates to be consistent with the observations. But essentially, the models both fit. They're not strongly constrained. But this kind of statistics is the way we have to start going with this if we want to understand population modeling. is, is not going to tell you anything until you start doing statistics and saying, what can we rule out clearly? What can we not rule out clearly? And, of course, the next approach is to take more realistic models and try and look at this in a statistical sense. So if anyone's reviewing my grant proposals anytime soon, I hope you're, hope you're open to this, this line of argument. Um, but the other thing is, this this argument is kind of too simplistic. There's the either-or scenario. This is a comparison between a pure viscous model and a pure wind-driven model. But in reality, we know both processes can happen in different regions of the same disk. And so, Simon Tong, who's a PhD student, technically a PhD student in, in Leicester, has been working on models where she tries to look at more realistic disks that have... So alpha is the accretion parameter, the efficiency of the accretion. And we have SS for Shikoshi Niaya, plus the turbulent number, and DW for disk wind. And we basically have a defined region, which is the dead zone in the disk. So you have the inner disk where it's hot and it's warm enough to be turbulent. You have a middle region where it's basically cold and dead and neutral, and that's dominated by the wind. And then you have an outer region where the disk is pretty optically thin, and that can be either active or passive, depending on the ionization physics. And, the, and so we basically have a model where the accretion efficiency and the wind efficiency vary as functions of radii, and the relative things here are parameters we can turn up and down in the model. And the size of the dead zone is something we can vary in the model. So this is a more realistic kind of hybrid model where we have both modes of accretion happening simultaneously in different regions of the disk. And Simmons has been looking at exploring more realistic models to see, first of all, what do they do? Do they look different to simple models? And then if we were to observe them, what would we see? And so there's some interesting results with this. The first, the, the first thing is that when you run these models, these are the fiducial models from Simmons' paper, um, at the transition regions, and this has been known for a while, but it's interesting to see it in these evolution models, where you have a transition from a dead zone to an active zone, you always get some kind of structure, a bump or a gap or a pile up. And the reason for that is that basically you have a continuous, the, the mass flow rate is constant, but if you change the accretion efficiency across a line, you change the, the surface density. And so you get a pile up of material or you get a depletion of material depending on the relative efficiencies across the gap. So you get rings or you get gaps and you get higher rings or lower rings and gaps, depending on what's going on at the accretion efficiency at the edge of the zones. And this is something we're thinking about trying to relate to the structures that we observe in, in disks. I showed you the HL tau observation with all the rings and gaps. Everybody wants those all to be planets because that's the exciting interpretation, but there are way too many of them to all be planets. There are many more gaps and rings than there are no and exoplanets that are big enough to make gaps and rings. So some of these things are probably telling us about disk physics underlying. And so we're, we're trying to work out ways that we can relate these kind of structures to observables in the in the disk structure plane. But also, whether your disk appears to be viscous or wind-driven depends on what observable you use. If you look at the disk sizes, you'll get a different answer than if you look at the accretion rates, because there's multiple things going on at once. And so Simon described this as basically disks having distinct personalities. The, you know, the, this population of disks is a population of disks that might not all be accreting in the same way. Some of them will have be more efficient in different phases. And so you have to consider the population as a, as a, as a range of parameters, not one, one model with a, with a spread. And so a couple of the more interesting results from this, it's quite an involved paper. This is looking at accretion rate against disk mass and looking at different different accretion efficiencies in the dead zone. And we're slightly low on the, the, the models because we start off with a low mass disk for technical reasons, but we, we do pretty well. But the interesting thing in the middle one here is the blue and the purple are all the model tracks for different disks with Simmons model. The red one, the orange one that goes that way is a pure viscous model. The one that goes this way is a pure wind-driven model. And so in the accretion rates, Almost all these models look viscous, even though, though most a lot of the accretion is being driven by the wind. Because the accretion, what you observe in the accretion rate is the accretion close to the star with the viscosity is doing it. And so even though in some of these models, the bulk of the accretion is being driven by magnetized wind, if you look at them in a and compare to what a, a, a simple model looks like, those ones still look more like the viscous model than a wind-driven model. Um, 
if you if you look at disk sizes, you see the other thing, the, the opposite. So this is looking at disk sizes now as a function of age from a sort of population spread. And it turns out if you look at the disk sizes, measuring disk sizes is a strong function of, because the disk kind of tapers exponentially in the outer regions. What you measure for the size is a very strong function of how sensitive your observation is. Um, and if you basically, there, this, with armor, this is done either with snapshot observations that are quite short integrations or with very long deep integrations on a small number of sources. And it turns out the snapshot ones are basically in the regime where you're mostly just pr probing the sensitivity of the observations and not the actual disk sizes. So the, the red ones, these, this is a model that where the disks spread significantly with time. They should, the actual model, the disks get bigger. But the observed sizes from the low sensitivity of observations are basically just flat with time. And in the, if you have higher sensitivity, and this is basically the highest you can do before you start to lose sensitivity to the, the, the tracers, if you have too low a density, all your molecules get photoionized and you can't see any lines. Um, you can still sort of see a hint of an increase, but actually it's quite difficult to do this with real. So the underlying disk size and the observed disk size are not the same, and you need to be very careful when comparing those things. So yeah, that's my summary of disk accretion. We think we understand that we, we see evidence for both modes of accretion. Real disks have both things going on. And we're going to have to start being more careful and taking, giving a bit more thought to how we interpret statistical data if we want to look at understand this more. Because I think the simple, it's this or it's this picture is starting to break down. It's both, and we need to start thinking more properly about how it's both and how that's driving evolution on on longer time scales. So that's my whistle stop tour of disks. I'm going to finish by talking about planets and tilts and warps and shadows. And this is looking for signatures of planets in disks, and this is work that. Um, Theory works mostly led by Beck Nealon when she was in Leicester a few years ago. And we've got new HST observations that were led by John Devis at Space Telescope that have, uh, that's why I'm talking about this again rather than two or three years ago. And so um, the motivation for this is that if you look at disks in scattered light, so if you look in the infrared where you're seeing infrared emission from the star that's scattering off the disk surface and coming towards us, if you look at disks that are, you, you see all kinds of structures in the scattered light that you didn't expect. So this is TW Hydro, which is a face on disk, and this is another face on disk. What you see is they're not uniform, and they don't just have rings and gaps. They have azimuthally asymmetric features. You have dark regions and light regions. This one's quite extreme. You have a dark side and the light side of the disk. This is a disk that's facing on, and it's starlight coming towards you off the surface. So why is this side dark and this side light? And in this one, in TW Hydra, John Davison Co. showed that actually they observed it twice a year apart, and the dark region moved. It rotated by about 15 degrees. Um, and this is at, in this particular system, this is about 50, 60 AU. Now, the orbital time scale at 50 or 60 AU is hundreds of years. It did not move 15 degrees in a year through orbiting. Nothing out there moves that fast. This has to be something closer in that's casting a shadow on the disk that has processed around or rotated around. This is what we're seeing out here are shadows of structures closer in that are, that are moving on the time scales of things orbiting on short periods and casting shadows further out. And so... Um, it's basically what strongly suggested that what we're seeing here is, is features close to the star at a few AU where planets might be forming, casting shadows on the outer parts of the disk. And so um, the premise is if you have a, a misaligned disk, disks with small tilts or warps, um, this is back schematic of a, a planet tilting the inner part of the disk. Um, this makes the whole thing much more complicated because warps are not equilibrium structures. Everything moves, nothing's ever static. Once you tilt part of a disk with respect to another part of the disk, everything processes it differentially. You can't just do static models, you have to do dynamic models. Um, but also, if you look at basically damping time scales, if you warp a protoplanetary disk, these things live for millions of orbits or billions of orbits. The warp is usually damped away quite quickly unless you have something to sustain it. So you need some kind of dynamical perturbation to keep tilting the disk, to keep something out of the plane. Otherwise, it just damps back down. And so there are lots of ways you can do this. Something like a, a binary companion is the obvious one if you have a misaligned star, but that's not the case for that for those particular sources. Um, Close to the star, the stellar magnetic field disrupts the inner part of the disk. That's how the accretion flow works. And in some sources, we see the magnetic field is not aligned with the rotation axis. So that's one way of tilting the inner, part, inner edge of the disk. And also, if you have any misaligned planets, that would be a way, if you could pick a planet somewhat out of the plane, that would be a way of tilting the disk. And we know in the solar system, the solar system planets are more or less in the same plane, but they're actually misaligned by six or seven degrees. And it doesn't. this doesn't need to be a very big tilt to cast a shadow. You're only talking about tilting at a few degrees. And so... Back around a series of simulations looking at what happens if you put planets on tilted orbits and disks and how they tilt things. So this is a simulation which burned an awful lot of computing time on Dirac. Um, this is the most extreme one because it makes the most, it makes the best movie. We did this for much less extreme versions. So this is a, a six, six and a half Jupiter mass planet at 20 degrees. You get the same effect, but less pronounced with, with lower mass planets and lower tilts. 
what you see is the planet sort of causes a small gap in the disk, and as the inner part of the disk, the, the inner part of the disk basically tilts towards the planet's orbit. So you can see that the inner disk is tilting out of the plane. This is top down, this is edge on. Planet's here. And so the inner part of the disk is tilting out of the plane slowly. And the planet's able to sustain this misalignment between the inner disk and the outer disk. And so if you think about where the starlight goes now, the starlight scatters off the disk surface. This side is, if you look, if you're looking this way, this side's going to be dark and shadow, and this side's going to be light with extra radiation coming towards it. And if you're on the other side, you'll see the opposite. And so this is one way of making the inner part of the disk tilt, and the whole thing processes, and so you expect, you can infer where planets are and things from the time scales of precession. And so this is quite encouraging. And then after the hydro modeling, we did radio transfer modeling to see well, what does this actually look like. And this is a typical example for something like PW Hydra, um, where you see a shadow inside of the disk and a bright side of the disk, and you see hot and cold sides due to the different shadowing. And so you only need relatively small tilts to do this. Actually, you have to have a relatively small tilt to do this. If you tilt it 30, 40 degrees out of the plane, it's no longer casting a wide shadow. You've got a narrow thing and you see a narrow shadow. A small tilt gives you a big wide shadow. Um, there are some systems where you do see narrow shadows, and that's a different talk. Um, but then having done this, we sort of said, well, in this TV hydro, then is potentially a planet of a few Jupiter masses that misaligned by a degree or two, maybe 10 degrees or so in the inner disk. And John Debus got in touch and said, ooh, this is very exciting. Can you can you bring this modeling to our new HST program? And so we applied for follow-up HST observations to see the shadows moving again to determine what we're looking at, try and understand it. And we got a multi-cycle HST program approved to observe from 2020 through to 2024. And so this is published last year. This was the first visit with the new data. So this was what the shadow looked like in 2016. And we were expecting to see it, it move 15 degrees between 2016 and 15 and 16. We thought five years later, it'll just have moved around. It'll be down the bottom somewhere. The whole thing's processing around. It'll be nice and smooth. That's not what happened. Um, we looked at the data. We now, there's two shadows. There's a dark region here and a dark region down here. It doesn't look so clear in the in the image if you plot the brightness profile. So if you plot basically brightness as a function of angle, watching it go up and down. In 2016, they were all nice, smooth, sinusoidal things at all the different radii. The minimum was in the same place. The maximum was in the same place. It was a nice, smooth, coherent shadow. Now, there are two minima that go down and up and down and up. The maxima, and it's it's only in the inner part, the outer part, the shadows kind of faded away. This is not what we thought we were going to see. We have no blind idea what's going on here. And so we did not, there's no dynamical model we can come up with with, with a planet in a disk that gives you anything that looks like this. And so instead, um, separating the two shadows we did not expect. So instead, what we said was, well, let's take back, let's take a static model, simple geometry, and say, what's the simplest model we can construct that reproduces the basic structure of the disk and actually gives you shadows that look like this? And so the answer is you have to have at least two tilted rings to give you these two shadows, processing at different rates. So this is the sort of schematic of the, the model we have. And this is basically a purely geometric model. There's no detailed physics going in here. It's basically what geometry casts this set of shadows. You have two rings at kind of AU radii, one slightly closer in that's tilted by six or, uh, about seven degrees, and one slightly further out that's tilted by a little bit less. And that what's happened is if, if they processed at different rates, at one point their shadows are overlapping, and then they process around, and now their shadows are not quite overlapping, and that's why they split the thing in two. So it's the, it's the simplest model that works. I'm not suggesting it's the correct model, but it's the simplest model that works. Um, and the question now is basically, can we figure out what on earth gives you this kind of configuration in a disk? Because if that's what we're seeing in the inner disk, we need multiple sources of perturbations, or maybe it's one single perturbation that's processing differentially. It's not clear what's going on. So we're now trying to do dynamical modeling to figure out what on earth can give you this structure in a in a coherent model. Um, but we do have two more epochs of HSC data coming. So we're hoping it doesn't do anything. If it does something else again, yeah, I'm just wrapping up in a couple of minutes. If it does something completely different again, then I think we just have to stop and bang our heads on the table and, and give up and hand this problem back to the observers and say it's too hard. But um, yeah, that's kind of where we got to with this. It's it, the TV hydro disk appears to have two slightly misaligned inner disks, tilted by a few degrees and at slightly different position angles. So if they're perturbed that way by planets, then you need a planet at roughly five AU and a planet at roughly seven AU. But I'm not going to suggest that that's actually what we're seeing. I think we're well short of being able to say that's a detection. But it's quite suggestive. And so hopefully, if we see two more epochs of observations, we'll get precession time scales and we'll be able to put some some um, constraints in the model and something that fits. The, uh, it's quite a constraining set of observations over seven or eight years, multiple different epochs, but whether we can come up with one model that fits it all remains to be seen. So yeah, I'll finish 
that was, of course, this was being done, being led by Space Telescope. NASA obviously got their press people involved and decided they could come up with a much better. This is a schematic in the paper. This is the press release version of the same thing, um, which, you know, the, the artistic people are very, very good. But this is actually not a bad approximation of what we think the model actually looks like. It's a bit exaggerated in terms of the tilts and things, but this is more or less what we think we're seeing in the inner parts of these disks, or in this disk, at least. So, uh, yeah, that's my whistle-stop tour of, of disks. My summary, why should you care? What would you like to take away from the talk today? First thing is disks evolve, protoplanetary disks evolve, and planets form in evolving disks. There is no set of typical conditions for planet formation. If planets form at 1 million years, they form at very different conditions to if planets form at 5 million years, and the conditions are probably different in different disks. And if we want to understand planet formation, we need to understand disk evolution first, because otherwise everything in planet formation is basically not, not constrained. The dominant processes that drive disk evolution are a combination of accretion and mass loss. Um, in the mass loss case, we see evidence for both magnetized winds in more in younger systems and photoevaporative winds more in older systems. Um, and we think there's a sort of rough evolutionary sequence where one evolved into the other, but more JWST data will tell us a lot more about that over the next couple of years. On the accretion side, we see you can have turbulent accretion or you can have wind-driven accretion. Um, at the moment, having looked at this with statistics, we don't have a clear way of saying which is dominant, but again, looking at more realistic models that include both and trying to figure out how we can tie those to observables is the way forward to understand disk evolution from a statistical perspective. And the surprising thing from resolved observations of disks is that actually disk tilts and misalignments, disks are not entirely flat structures, disks have misalignments and tilts. Some of those are probably primordial from formation, some of them are due to perturbations from the from planets or stellar processes as the things are evolving. Tidal Hydra seems to have the thing with Tidal Hydra is it's the nearest disk and it's the brightest disk. So the old question is always, is it weird or is it just the one that we have the best data for? And we're still not there, I think. But Tidal Hydra, we can see, has a complex, multi-tilted inner disk structure that we're hoping to model with with better data over the next few years. But we don't understand what's driving it yet. So that's where we're hoping to go. So yeah, that's my summary for today. Um, hope to kept you entertained for an hour, and I'm happy to take questions. So thank you very much.